Okay. So let's uh, kind of start with with, um, uh, with two questions. First off, do you read the Old Testament? Mm -hmm. You do. What books do you guys read? No, like Psalms and Proverbs. Okay. All right. Great. Um, Esther and Job. Um, the prophets. Genesis. So all of it, or just the majority? The majority of it. Okay. All right. Yeah. If I read it? Yeah. Yeah, I read all of it. If I oh, okay. It. All right. Um, are there any books per se that you avoid? I would like not to read them, yeah. <laughs> Which ones? The numbers. No. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> She answered way too this, quick. You got this, and this, you got this. Yeah, I mean, it was nice to read them because I don't want to remember them anyway. I was like, honestly, what I do when I get to that point, I kind of just skim yeah. through it and then just keep going on with it. Yeah, that's what I do. I do. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Every now and then I'll read Revelation, but I try to avoid it. Yeah. I know what you mean. Because it makes me stressed out. <laughs> right. <laughs> Grace, did you? No, that, that's about okay. it. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just going to do the names. That's funny. So, what different types of literature are in the Bible? Literature is like a writing style. Okay. There's poems. Mm -hmm. Poetry. Huh? Poetry, yeah. Okay. There's... Haiku. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Letters addressed to churches, mm. right? Mm -hmm. Letters. Yes. Very true. Um, there's history. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's. Um, what do you call it when it's uh, prediction? Plus, I was going to say science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's no, aliens. <laughs> Well, what kind, of, what kind of literature that would be called? Um, prophetic? <laughs> uh, apocalyptic? Oh, oh, there you go. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Were you going to say something? There's Proverbs. Yeah. Mm, right. <laughs> <laughs> the whole you book is that. actually called no, that, Grace? Oh, 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 you said poems. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Grace. So there definitely is a large... Um, style in the Bible, I guess. Um, historical narrative, this is what Grace was talking about, the stories, the history. Um, uh, and the, the interesting thing about the history of the Bible is that the events recorded are, are factual. They, they, are, they did actually happen. Jonah really was eaten by a large fish. Uh, there really was a global flood. You know th these kinds of things like that. And and the reasons why we know this is because a the writing style of the books themselves. Um, B comparing them to other ancient Near Eastern writings. Um, and uh, also the way that Jesus talked about it. They, he always talked about them as though they were actual actually true, um, rather than just kind of that they weren't. But the thing about the history of the Bible is it's never just history for history's sake. The history of the Bible always always uses history as an opportunity to teach something. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like Acts, for instance. It's not just about the um, ooh chicken, yes please. It's not just about the um, the the early church. It's about you know it teaches valuable things from that. The way that the Holy Spirit was leading the church. The way that um, what, what they what they taught and, and and how they how they how they found out that salvation was more than just for Jews and it wasn't just about circumcision. It was a, a, it was by you know it was a thing of, of, of God God wanting to save everyone. And they, you know it shows these different these different messages. Um, the books of Kings or Chronicles it shows the effects of righteousness, the effects of sinfulness, now, things to do that, that are good to do, and then things that, to, that you can do that are, are that are bad. You know, it shows you just these, these this wide um, this wide change. Genesis, um, uh, you know, shows okay how everyone is under sin. It shows how how God's God tried to save people. It shows God's plan 
of salvation. It shows uh, God raising up Israel so that he could, in turn, save all of people. Um, you know, it goes to just these different things that, that are very important. Um, uh, for instance, uh, if I here's one thing that now I, my brain's a little fried, so I hope I'm I hope I'm remembering this right. Um, when Noah gets off the off the ark, you remember how he's got his three sons. Now one of his sons dishonors him by um, by seeing him nude and then ridiculing him basically. Um, it, it's kind of unclear as to whether or not um, he saw he was necessarily looking at his father in a sexual way or not. It's kind of unclear. But what is very clear, regardless of what, what that is, is that he was dishonoring his father. And so what happens? Well, Noah, Noah as he's doing, doing the blessings, over, kind of overlooks that son. He's kind of, I don't want to say cursed, but... He's well, not blessed. Let's just say that. Whatever you want to say. I don't want to get caught too much on, on, the, on, the, on the words there. And does anybody know what land his, his descendants filled up? Canaan. The land of Canaan. Really? Huh. See what I mean? Things like that where those genealogies are showing where these people came from. And, and how, I'll give you another example from the book of Genesis. Why was Judah chosen as the tribe that Jesus would come, come through rather than Reuben, the oldest son child? I know this and I can't remember now. It was a, it was a big. It, was, it has to do with um, 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 Joseph's side of. You know what I mean? Like from because Joseph was his favorite. Mm -hmm. So it, it kind of like. Wasn't David, I see what you're saying. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, no, because Joseph, um, from Joseph came Ephraim and Manasseh, not Judah. But I mean, I see what you're where you're going with that because Joseph was the favorite. Yeah. No, but it's still down the generation. Didn't David came from? No, 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 no. Judah was Joseph's brother. Um, mm. Judah didn't come from Joseph. That's that's what you're saying, yeah. right? Um, did anybody else have a guess? Because. Yeah. Sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, is it because the priests? Uh, no, but that's that's interesting too. Um, Reuben was overlooked because he slept with his father's uh, concubine. Right. And so then the next two in line were Simeon and Levi. Does anybody know why they weren't picked for the for where Jesus would come through? Because sorry, go ahead. Oh, is it because they massacred the? Yes, yeah, massacred, that, but yes. Massacred the people that. Um, Took advantage of their sister. Yeah, um, their sister was raped, and they slaughtered the whole town. Mm. And so, in the blessings, if you look at, at the end of Genesis, when Jacob goes to bless his sons, he overlooks his first three sons and goes to his fourth son, Judah, and then says, "The scepter will never depart from you, Judah." And so then, the promise was laid, and uh, uh, Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. Hmm. I paid attention to little details. See what I mean? This is what historical narrative in the Bible does. The stories. This is what they do. They, they, they use a roundabout way to teach us things. Rather than just saying, hey, honor your father and mother, they say, this is what example of what happens when you don't honor your father and mother. See what I mean? Or, um, rather than, why is God not using me? When you don't do things that are right, that are when you do things and you're inspired out of out of lust or out of passion and anger or whatever, you're gonna miss out on God's blessings for your life. See what I mean? And so they they, they take this this roundabout way to teach you a message rather than just saying, hey, don't do this. The, so then next up to that is the law. This is the exact opposite. This is what you should do, and this is what you should not do. Um, this is Israel's code. Now, people get a little bit confused, and they don't really understand how the law applies to us today. So they try to follow certain things verbatim, and then other things you just kind of overlook. And so first things first, the law applied to Israel. It was given to Israel. Okay. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying that it isn't applicable or it doesn't apply to the church of today. That's not what I'm saying at all. But what I am saying is it was directly given to the Israelites, not the church. Okay. Now, also, I want to add on that that the, the blessings were contingent on their seeking after the Lord. If, 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 basically, 
as you seek after me, these are the things that are going to follow. Or if you don't follow after me, these are the things that are going to happen. It's basically cause and effect. See what I mean? If you seek after me, I, I will sh overtake you with all these good things. I've got a land picked out for you. I've got all kinds of good things picked out for you guys. See what I mean? Um, and so how does this apply to us today? Well, we learn, we learn very important things about God um, in, in the law. First off, I'll give you an example. It goes through all these different things in chapter 19 about you know not, not cutting yourself and not, not trimming the edges of your beard, not getting tattoos. Why is this important to us today? Because God was saying to them back then, don't worship these other gods, and don't worship me in the way that these other pagans worship their gods. This is how I want you to worship me. And so what do we learn from that? We learn that God is a unique God, and that he doesn't want us to, to, to met, uh, mix our culture with our worship of him. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'll give you an example in modern day how that applies to us today. Um, a lot of people would... Um, would uh, I think, okay, it's a normal activity to get divorced and remarried however many times you want, which, I mean, it is, but what do we learn, what do we learn from God's laws about how he doesn't desire for these things, right? How he, how he desires people to be restored to one another. He desires uh, for people to forgive one another. Um, excuse me. Uh, he desires for all these different things. See what I mean? So, so we learn we learn in the law things that were directly applicable to Israel that still do apply to us because they teach us about God's holiness and his morality. They teach us about right and wrong. Granted, there are a lot of things in the law that are hard to understand because it's separated by such a distance. Leviticus chapter 12 is what I always think of. How women had to do certain things after they had a baby. You know yeah. what I mean? And it's just like, wait, what? You know what I mean? It's, some things are just so far separated from our culture, it's very hard to just understand. But nevertheless, um, the laws do still apply to us. We just don't have to follow them. Does that make sense? But just to kind of clarify, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't do things that are in the law just because we're free of the law. Oh, I, it was in the law that you shouldn't have sex with an animal. Hey, I'm, I'm free, right? Well, you still shouldn't have sex with an animal. <laughs> See what I mean? Like, that didn't... Hold on. <laughs> Don't do things that are lawless just because you're free of the law. Does that make sense? Right. We still, we still live um, to God honor God. Law. Yeah, exactly, to honor God. And that was, the, that was the center of the law, was honoring God. In fact, Jesus summated all of it like this. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. So we know right there that the law is about loving people and loving God, not about following all the right things. Does that make sense? So it shows us God's laws. It shows us his morality. It shows us a glimpse of who God is. See what I mean? There was something else I was going to say. Oh, yes. Also, um, with the law, one more thing I, I, I remember. Um, the New Testament is not a new book of the law. Does that make sense? It's just fulfilling. Isn't it? Well, Jesus fulfilled it, yes. But what I'm getting out about is like in the letters and stuff that Paul wrote. Um, those, especially in like, we get to like first Timothy and that kind of stuff. And he says, you know, he, he basically tells them to do a few things, you know what I mean? And he's not saying this is a new book of the law. What he does, what he, what Paul is doing is he's taking the old Testament and he's applying it to us in the, in the modern church day. The, that's what the letters are. They, Paul has taken the principles of the old Testament and applied them to the new Testament. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, um, So always important to remember that the, that the early church, they used the Old Testament. That was their Bible. Never forget that. There was no New Testament. Right, right. And they wrote the New Testament based off How of far the Old Testament. Did they, did they have the Old Testament? I don't know. Was it like all the way to, what's the last book, Malachi? Or what's the last, did they have the whole thing? Yes, yes. Oh, okay. um, the Old Testament was finished writing um, sometime between 400 BC, I want to say, somewhere around there. Three or four hundred BC, um, and so it was about three hundred years that they had the Bible before Jesus came, the Old Testament. Does that make sense? Oh, but they actually at first they didn't have anything. Well, Abraham didn't, um, and they didn't have any scriptures really until Moses, and then Moses started writing things, mm -hmm. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, um, and then Joshua did some writing too in there, uh, and then you know uh, the prophet Sam. Uh, Samuel wrote, did some writing. Then the prophet Jeremiah did some writing, and on, well, on so on and so forth. Got, like, added up right, as time, as time went on. Yeah, exactly. 
the the first bit of the old of the Old Testament that was written was Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay. That was that was a, a a one part deal. You know what I mean? We try to separate them because they're different Bibles books in our Bible, mm -hmm. but it was one unit. Right. Huh. Yeah. Um, and and that was written by Moses, which means it was written around 1400 BC, somewhere around there. 1400, 1200 BC, somewhere in that area. It's kind of hard to date precisely because we don't know exactly when the Exodus was. If we knew exactly when the Exodus was, we would know exactly when the Old Testament was written, but we don't. <laughs> I mean, it really doesn't help because Moses only calls him Pharaoh. He doesn't call him his name. Pharaoh what? Mm. Pharaoh... Tethmosis? <laughs> Amenhotep? <laughs> Which one? <laughs> he doesn't say. So, um, <clears throat> Then there's poetry, which Gracie mentioned. Um, the thing about poetry in the Bible is it's not always literal. Oftentimes, it just uses figures of, as figures of speech to relay something in an emotional way. Furthermore, the law is, I mean, sorry, the, the poems are not always correct. Do you hear what I'm saying? They're not always correct. I'll give you an example. There's a, a psalm where the psalmist says, Oh, how I wish that somebody would take their babies and dash them against the stones. This is something that this person was genuinely feeling. It was, they, were, they were being emotional and expressing that to the Lord. They were not rebelling against the people. They were singing a song to the Lord about their anguish because these people had done that very same thing to their babies. See what I mean? And so they were, they, they, they were singing, their, we're supposed to be God's chosen. Why is he not doing anything about this? Oh, how blessed it would be if somebody would give them back to them what they did to us. See what I mean? And you can just feel the irritation in the psalmist, psalmist uh, the way he writes. You know what I mean? Um, or that whoever wrote that psalm. Um and so it's not always necessarily right, but we can still learn things from them. For instance, in that poem that he says about dashing the babies against the stones, remember that he, he does place his, his trust in God. He didn't understand the situation. He was obviously very angry at the situation, but he still trusted God. He didn't, he didn't go to extra lengths to try and accomplish God's will for him. He, he, he wrote this song about how he felt, and he sang it to the Lord, and that's where it stopped. When you are going through times of anguish, it is okay to open up to the Lord, since the Lord already knows what you're thinking anyways. Now, I wouldn't talk disrespectfully to the Lord, because that's just a dumb thing to do. Right. <laughs> but, nevertheless, I would be open with the Lord, rather than trying to hide your emotions from him, like he's going to not love you if you say what you're actually thinking. Does that make sense? Um... But they are very emotional. For instance, if you read Isaiah, a lot of Isaiah is written in a poetical form. You know what I mean? Like he uses different poetry styles and whatnot. Um, and he says things in there that aren't actually literal. Like in one of the prophets, I don't remember which one, but he says about the trees uh, waving their hands. And trees don't have hands. They're not really waving. You know what I mean? He's just talking about them shaking. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? Right. He's saying something in a more expressive way or in a more emotional way. I mean, those of you who, who did poetry in high school, I don't know if you guys did or not, but I kind of struggled my way through it. I, I was terrible with poetry. Um, but, I mean, if you understand poetry, you'll understand you know, this idea of expression and using uh, figures of speech like um, allegory and, and metaphors and those kinds of things. Any questions on poetry? But it is very emotional. A lot of times people, goodness sakes, you'd think that somebody was dying. I had a phone call from Africa three times in the middle of the night. What? Go figure. Oh my goodness. The Reverend Randall. I'm going to give him a wedgie when he comes back from Albuquerque. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry. Back to this. Um, I was talking about history, history law, poetry. Um, and the last thing I said was, I was talking about... Being expressive. Right, um, and how it's not always literal, and sometimes people try to bend the poetry to make it always literal, because everything in the Bible, in order for it to be true, has to be completely literal all the time. Well, no, that's not true. It's still true, but it's not absolutely literal all the time. We talked about this with Revelations. Anyways. Um, and the Bible accurately records things that were wrong as well. Like, for instance, when Satan says something that's not true, it accurately records that, but Satan is still a liar. See what I mean? Right. Does that make sense? So, um, then it ha then there's the prophets, which is basically sermons. I mean, 
simply enough. And the idea of the prophets is restoration. I know a lot of times people have this idea that the prophets were just out there yelling at people and they were just crazies who were just taking out their frustration and God would give them a message to say, and oh boy, they really gave it to them. But the heart of the prophets, if you really study their 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 forms and what they were saying, their lives, uh, what they did with their messages, all these different lengths that they went to, you see that you see honest people who are seeking after the Lord that the Lord used to deliver His message of restoration and repentance, because God doesn't desire for His people to be cursed. He doesn't desire for His people to live in a way that leads them to more sin and, and binds them up. He doesn't desire for that for them. He wants to bless them. See what I mean? And so he's always giving out this message of restoration. Turn from what you're doing. You're my people. Why are you doing this stupid thing that you're doing? Repent. Come back to me. And he even goes to, and goes to the lengths of using his prophets to speak to other nations. For instance, Jonah, who went to um, uh, Nineveh to speak to the Syrians. You know what I mean? Um, Nahum... I think, who went to Assyria a hundred years later, you know, all these different kinds of things. Oh, have no fear. I thought somebody was going to come in here and beat us up. It's just Brittany. Oh, thank God. <laughs> just kidding. Um, so then, uh, besides the prophets, um, there is wisdom. The wisdom books, um, and, and these are books that are very non-traditional. If you look at the whole, whole Old Testament, you know they kind of have a theme to it. But then you get to wisdom, the wisdom books, and they don't really fit that same click. You know, you have Job, which has poetry in it, but the whole book, he's faced with this unfair situation that God won't answer him on, with three friends who are very unhelpful and a wife who's unsupportive. It's just terrible. And then at the end, he still doesn't get all of his questions answered. See what I mean? Right. Rather than just telling you what God's trying to say, he gives you this, what is it, 40 or 50 chapter long deal It doesn't answer the question. <laughs> I know, it's like it's going over and over. Right? And so, you know, he shows us a few things that were obviously wrong. Like, for instance, just because someone's going through hard times doesn't mean that they sinned. Things like that. Um, uh, and it obviously shows us, you know, the importance of seeking after God in these situations and whatnot. But still, um, doesn't just say what it's trying to say. Ecclesiastes. What is it seven or eight chapters? Nine, somewhere in there? Eleven? I thought it was twelve. Somewhere around there. Maybe it's twelve. I don't know. It's a, a bit on. Yeah, it's probably, you're probably right. It's probably around twelve. Let's just say twelve. And we'll leave it. <laughs> uh, so, you know, in twelve chapters goes through this thing of, of what the purpose is of life, and then we really don't get much closure on that either. Because this is this is the point of Ecclesiastes. Spoiler alert. Um, living wise is a good thing, but ultimately it doesn't matter. Living foolishly is a bad thing, but ultimately it doesn't matter. Everything you do in life does not matter, unless God is the center. That's how the book ends. Well, seek him while you're young. Pl plant your foundation in God, because you're gonna look for look for you're gonna look for your purpose everywhere. You're gonna try to reason, and you're not gonna find it through 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 hard mental labor. You're not gonna find it there. You're gonna do you're gonna live what you think is right, and you're not gonna find your purpose there. You're gonna live for pleasure and do whatever you want, and you're not gonna find purpose there. Your purpose is gonna be found in making God the center of your life, and that's why the book ends on that note. See what I mean? Wisdom, living wise, is a good thing, but ultimately, without God, is pointless. It makes no. It, it, it makes. What, how does the Bible say it? To have, to have um, conquered the whole world and lose your soul, lost your soul. It's basically the same kind of idea. You can live your whole life and be the most financially responsible person, who even Dave Ramsey stops and takes his hat off. But at the end of the day, if you're not saved, it doesn't matter. Your money gone. However wise you lived, the project is just going to go to the next person when you die. And in a hundred years, people forget about, forget you ever lived. See what I mean? It's not, it's not, there, there's no point to it. Unless God is there, then all of a sudden, everything you do has a purpose. See what I mean? Um, which is why I get so lost when Christians try to make the world conform to their way of living without experiencing the power of God. Yeah. What's the purpose? Who cares if America is the most righteous nation if they don't know God? 
We need to get people saved. We don't need them to get to follow, follow the book of the law. See what I mean? We need to get people saved. Jesus came to seek and to save that which was lost, not to make them, you know, uh, perfect Pharisees. In fact, he reprimanded the Pharisees for how what a high stake they put on the law rather than on people and God. <laughs> See what I mean? So, um, but the prophets, going back to the prophets, um, the prophets can be very difficult to understand if you don't understand when they were written. And to that end, I have videos on on my YouTube, if you guys are interested, that, that, that talk about when the different prophets were written. Um, also, in the in the future, we, we're, we're going to do another class that talks about um, the, it, the Bible as a whole. Just it makes it really simple. You know, it, it breaks down all the big words and everything, all the difficult concepts, and it makes it a lot more easy to understand. If you're interested in that, whenever we know what the heck we're doing with it, I'll let you guys know. Um, but the, remember to see the prophets as sermons to get to draw people into God, and it's a lot easier to understand what they're talking about. But anyways, and as always, never use the Bible to beat people over the head. You you're missing the point of the of the of whatever you're reading if that's what you're using it for. Um, letters, uh, Diana mentioned this. These are these are interesting because um, they are written by people after Jesus came. To address specific problems that the church was having. Okay, that's very important to note. They are not to be understood just broadly. They have to be understood in context. I'll give you an example. In 1 Corinthians, Paul says, um, basically, I can do whatever I want, but that's not necessarily good for everybody. Well, at first it sounds like I can do whatever I want. But what he's actually saying is the Corinthians were writing him. They wrote him a letter. And they said, now... We can eat this meat sacrifice to, to idols, right? Because there there are no other gods besides God, and so it really doesn't matter. And so these other people are just getting their feelings hurt. Tough luck. And so then Paul writes back and says, Now, we all have knowledge, but knowledge puffs up, and love edifies. What is he saying? Love looks out for the well-being of someone else. Is this gonna? Is your eating this meat going to offend somebody else? Then just get other meat. I mean, goodness sakes, why does this have to be such an issue? You know what I mean? I think about my, like thinking back then, um, people were so poor that instead of going seeking somewhere else, they would just eat whatever was in front of them. Right. Because it's free. Right. And I think they had a really big issue with that too. Yeah. I yeah. Say. Um, probably. Yeah. Uh, but also, and the thing that I was talking about with um, um, what was the first thing I said about? Oh yeah, about um. All, um, I can do. I can basically do whatever I want. But he's actually quoting what the Corinthians were arguing to him. Yeah, you could do whatever you want, but not all of it's beneficial. See, you could do all, whatever you want, but you're forgetting about loving people. See what I mean? So he's quoting them. He's not saying yes, you can in fact do whatever you want. See what I mean? So re remember these kinds of things. These are situation specific letters. Okay. Why I'm pushing that so hard is, let's say I write Gracie a love letter. In 500 years, this letter is discovered. Go ahead. But they do apply today, too, right? Yes. The whole Bible applies to us today. No, I mean, even these letters, even though they were directed to those churches back then, mm -hmm. I've had a situation that happened to me in right. my house. Right. And I had to cook the other meat just because I didn't want to tempt them. Right. And I'm like, well, I don't care what you eat. Here it is. Right. But don't criticize me what I eat. I'm not going to criticize what you're going to eat. Right. And oftentimes they do because they're not so far away from us as, let's say, Genesis, Texas, Leviticus. You know what I mean? They're not so far away. Um, however, there are some things that are a little bit lost in um, the shuffle. You know what I mean? Because 2,000 years is still 2,000 years. And whereas there's more that applies to us without us even having to do any real hard study, like the thing with the meat, there are other things that don't really apply. I mean, that not, not that don't apply to us, but don't directly apply. We have to kind of do a little bit more digging. See what I mean? Like, for instance, the Bible doesn't talk about marijuana because marijuana wasn't a thing back then. Right. It wasn't a hot topic. Now, you have to shift through that back then to figure out what it says about it. See what I mean? Does that make sense? And that's what I'm talking well, about. Well, it like, still says do not use drugs, but, I mean, it doesn't say specific. <laughs> uh, and that's what I'm talking about, where, where you have to, where you have to realize that the that it's not necessarily something that directly relates every single time. Mm -hmm. It's something that you have to. Sometimes you have to, and with all the Bible, you have to, you have to realize why it was written in the first place, and then you'll understand how it applies to you. That makes sense. Yeah. Does that, does that kind of make sense? Um, 
For instance, Romans. He's talking about these different things with the Jews and the Gentiles. And he goes to this long thing about Jews being, you know, of being elect and all these different things. And you're just like, how does this have anything to do with anything? Until you realize that what caused the book of Romans to be written. The Jews were expelled from Rome because there was a tiff between the, Jew, the Jews and the Christians, basically, is what historians think. Um, because and the Romans didn't know what was going on. They just knew there was a problem with the Jews. Well, because Christians were thought of as Jews back then. They were just a sect of Jews. Does that make sense? So they expelled them all. They just said, okay, get out of here, all of you. And as a result, the church that was growing in Rome was mostly Gentile. There weren't a whole lot of Jews there. But then, shortly before the book of Romans was written, the Jews were allowed to return back to Rome. So they go back, and what do you have now? You have Jews and Gentiles, and there's a huge sect between them. Huge clash. They're just not really absorbing one another, let's just say. They're just kind of two cliques. That makes sense? And so Paul writes the book of Romans. Now all of a sudden, all those things about the Jews and the Gentiles make sense. See what I mean? And so now, in sifting through that, we can see how it more directly applies to us. Like, for instance, the thing about Jews being elect. That makes sense? Kind of? Okay. Um, but then we get we get really lucky sometimes, like what Diana was talking about, and we don't even have to do any legwork. It directly applies, and we don't even have to do anything. All right. Um, then there's the gospel uh, and Acts. And I already talked about how Acts is in with the historical narrative. Um, but the Gospels are very unique because they are historical narrative, yes, but then they're also they're, the the way that the stories are put in there are not necessarily in, in how the order that they happened, but are in a certain order to kind of prove a point. Like I, the the example that I always use first off, the book of Luke, uh, the Gospel of Luke, he talks about. I'll show you. In chapter 4, look what he does here. He talks about, at the, right here in chapter, the end of chapter 3, he talks about the genealogy of Jesus. Jesus' parentage, where he came from. And then he instantly talks about the temptation of Jesus, where Jesus is taken out into the wilderness with Satan and all that nonsense. And then he goes to Jesus' public ministry starting. Why is that important? Because the order of events teaches us something. Jesus was fully human. Who, do, who does Luke trace Jesus back to? Oh, all the way back to Adam and then God. Why did he do that? Because he wanted to show that Jesus was fully human, and he was fully tempted, but yet he was without sin, and he was used by God in ministry. See, he just taught you an, he just taught you something by the by the order of events that he did. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Yeah. And oftentimes he'll they'll do that with like the parables too. You'll stumble on like a theme in parables where he's trying to say different things. That makes sense by the way that the that, that the par the order that the parables are told in. And obviously they're not concerned in saying everything that Jesus did, and they're not concerned in in necessarily seeing the or the actual order that the events happened. They're concerned in teaching a point. Not that the not that the things in the gospels aren't true, but the gospels are all in kind of a different order. You know what I mean? Like Matthew, Mark, Luke, they have a lot to do in common, but there's some in, in not – they're all three different books. And then John is just kind of way out there with his own different thing, and he has his own different writing style, and Jesus doesn't even talk like he does in the other books. You see what I mean? Because you – oh, know, I'm getting ahead of myself, but anyways. Um, yeah. So the Gospels teach us different, les different lessons like that. So they are history, but they're selective history. That makes sense? They don't include everything that Jesus did, everything that Jesus said. Just the things that the writer thought was important. That makes sense? Yeah. So it's important to realize that because the Gospels do not answer everything about Jesus' life. Yeah. They just answer the things that, that, that was important to pass on to the next generation. Um, Revelation uh, you know, talks about the, the future events and, and, and the, the role that the church plays and, and how... Um, and, and how we should we should get through hard times and whatnot stuff like that with temptations and trials and whatnot. Um, good uh, good book, obviously it's in the Bible. But um, with that being said, um, it's a little bit harder to understand Revelation because almost everything is in this metaphor and, and everything. He hardly ever just straight out says something. Very rarely does does the Book of Revelation just say something. He always takes like this long, circuitous route, and I'm not saying it's bad. I'm just saying because of that, a lot of people have gone off and 
made all kinds of theology off the book of Revelation that the rest of the Bible just does not support at all. And, uh, so, anyways, I guess there will always be some books that people have a hard time understanding. Just the way it goes, I guess. Um, but anyways, um, and how does the book of Revelation apply to us? Because it teaches us, as we go through these times, there's a reason why, because of the end coming and whatnot, there's something that we can do about it in seeking after God. It tells us um, in hard times that, that, that our effort isn't for waste. There will be a, 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 something good that comes out of it. it. tells us, hey, don't get too bogged down. This isn't your home. You've got something more, more something better coming. So uh, it teaches a lot of different things like that. Um, yeah. But everything in the Bible is situation-specific. And remember that at best, the situation is 2,000 years past. At worst, it's like, what, 3,000, 3,000, 4,000 years separated? I mean, that's a, that's, a big, that's a big gap. But when you realize that everything in the Bible is situation-specific, it's easier to understand because you don't have to, like, how does this directly apply to me? Well, what, how does it apply to them? And then you'll know how it applies to you. See what I mean? Um Everything in the Bible still applies. There's not one bit of the Bible that is not for us today. Every single bit of it is for us today. However, some are some parts are easier to, to apply than other parts. For instance, you hit the genealogies and you're like, oh my gosh, is this ever going to end? But then you read, like, let's say, uh, Matthew, and you're like, oh my gosh, I, I, I can just read this all day. Because it's so much easier to directly apply to today. Does that make sense? So... But everything does still apply, it's just harder on some parts than it is other parts. Um, so what four steps will help you apply any passage of the Bible? Do you guys remember? Down there. Yes. Yes. Very good. Um, I got the rest. <laughs> That's okay. The bridge. Uh-huh. Yes. You missed a step, but you got yeah, three know, of them. Yeah, I did one. The, um, the one before application. Yeah. Um, I want to say context, but I don't think that's context. Um, I have it in my Bible in my car. Yeah. Oh, you have your cheat sheet, huh? <laughs> <laughs> um, two years ago. Calls? Yeah. Yeah, two years. Two years ago. Three years ago. Yes. I think it was two years ago. I'm gonna say it's two years ago. Two years ago, we taught we ta I taught a, a um, Bible interpretation class in the Yams for like it was like a year long or something like that. Um, so first, what does it what did it mean to them? This is then and there. What what uh, what Diana just said. Uh, basically, it's where you try to understand it as the person who is hearing it for the first time would have understood it. Um, and this is very specific. Moses told the Israelites that they needed to not worship any other gods. Specific. So, I mean, this is about them, then, and there, what it meant to them. Well, coming from Egypt, there, where there was a plethora of gods, yes, I said plethora, uh, <laughs> it was a, quite a change to understand a god that was actually active, and loving, and only one. Quite a change. And wasn't confined to the Nile, or to the mountain, or to this or that. He was with them wherever they went. So that was kind of a, kind of a big deal. Um, so, uh, what has changed? I, I, reworded the, I reworded it how I had it two years ago, but um, it's, it's basically um, that same step of, of, of measuring the distance across the river. Yes. Um, what what is different from then to now? Well, we're not under the ever, under the covenant. Israel was. Do you know what I mean? We've been grafted in. Israel was the branch, or the vine. We've been grafted into the vine. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You see how how how? It, what's different from from now to then, or then to now, I guess. Um, and third, what broader principle is the same? This is where you say now what stayed the same. We are God's people. Israel was God's people. See what I mean? Um, does that kind of make sense? In fact, you write, at, uh, write down on your sheet, after whatever you just wrote, write down um, what is the same. What is the same. 
because I think that might help you a little bit more than the broader principle. Um, and when you see what, what's the same, it's a lot easier to, to, to kind of, um, well, to go to the next step. Um, what new application can come from the principle? This is specific. You here and now. I can stop doing this, or I can seek God in this, or I can trust God for this, or I can, see what I mean, based off of how this applies. Does that make sense? So what has changed? Well, I don't live in an Egyptian society where there's a lot of gods. Um, however, I live in a I, I live in a society that gods are kind of seen as unscientific and just kind of foolish. Um, so then that raises up. Well, so our, my culture still has something that um, it sees as a god, you know, technology or science or this or that, or whatever. And uh, they lift it up in place of God, the same as the Egyptians lifted up their idols in place of God. Okay. Um, so what broader princi principle is the same? Um, God still doesn't want me to worship worship other gods, the same as God didn't want them to worship other gods. God wants me to be devoted to him, the same as he wanted them to be devoted to him. Does that make sense? So as I was applied to today, I shouldn't allow video games to get a hold on my life. Whatever you guys, uh, uh, your allergies, I don't, I don't know, whatever. I don't, I don't know, man. I can't think of anything. And allergies aren't really a sin, if you think about it. They're just... Uh, it, <laughs> right. So pretend like I had said something really smart that really applies to you. Pretend that I had said that and run wild with that. Uh, <laughs> um, but yes, yeah, it's, it's specific to you. Okay, so now that's what you should do based off that passage. Does that make sense? So. And let, let's take, for example, uh, the meat thing that Diana brought up. Great example. Okay. What did it mean to them? Well, in the marketplaces, they had meat that would be sold or given. As she, I don't know, if, I don't know about that, but uh, uh, basically, meat that had been in in the process of um, sacrifice, basically, to other gods besides God. Um, and they were curious as to how to deal with this problem. Um, what has changed? We don't really have a marketplace where people offer meat that's been offered to gods and different things. We don't really have that nowadays. We just kind of have meat at the store. Um, however, what has stayed the same? People can still get their feelings hurt based off of what they see as not honoring God. Be it actually a modern day meat situation or be it um, uh, uh, drinking or what, what? somebody getting a tattoo. Somebody getting a tattoo. Be it whatever it is. See what I mean? Uh, people can still um, kind of use that a as an opportunity that will lead them to sin. And so, what should I do? I, the same as the Corinthians, should make sure not to do things that purposely offend other people. Rather, I should be concerned for my brothers and sisters in Christ and do things to help them grow rather than only focus on myself. So specifically, um, let's say I'm thinking about getting a tattoo, and there's like, um, Diana is, oh, no, no, tattoos are the devil, and I used to have tattoos all over the place, and, and I had to get them removed because I just feel like that's worshiping the devil. And so now I have caused her to, to maybe be led to sin by my actions. Well, so maybe I shouldn't do that. See what I mean? So, anyways. Um... Um, also, I want to add this in here. I have it as a note here. Um, write this down. Does the New Testament shed any light? When you're reading the Old Testament, is there anything in what you're reading that the New Testament kind of clarifies? I'll give you an example because I, I, I think that maybe I didn't say that very good. The book of Leviticus talks about the priests and the priesthood, right? Well, the New Testament gives light that Jesus is our great high priest, huh? Gives light about how he, how he fulfilled the law, right? So we know right there the things that applied to the priesthood might not apply so much anymore because we're trusting in Jesus, who is the great high priest, right? But it also says in First Peter, I believe, that we are all priests. Now, what does this mean? Well, in context, it means that we are all called to worship and glorify God, all of us. And we're all called to be a light to the nations. Does that make sense? doesn't necessarily mean that you have to go through rituals. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about how we are all, we all show the light of God. That makes sense?
So, does the New Testament shed any light? Always stop and ask that when you're reading the Old Testament. What is it? Does the New Testament shed any light? Does it clarify something that the Old Testament is talking about? Because sometimes they'll do the legwork for you. You know what I mean? Like, you can read the Old Testament and realize that the sacrifices were necessary in part because death is the price of sin and the people needed an atonement. And we all, you can also realize that the sacrifices were not good enough because they had to keep doing them. However, Hebrews tells you that for you so you don't have to wander anymore because it tells you, yes, those sacrifices were inefficient. Jesus is the perfect sacrifice who died once for all, so we don't have to keep doing that. See what I mean? It clarifies for you, so you don't have to do the legwork. So check with the New Testament, um, and it'll usually clarify a lot of things. What can you do to better understand Scripture? Any ideas? First off, pray. Yes, very good. Pray. Anything specific to pray for? Um, just for God to help you understand more. What is this happening? Let's just try to get a little bit of 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 a very good. Very good. Any other ideas? Reread it. Read it multiple times. Mm -hmm. I think so too. Very good idea. Read surrounding verses mm -hmm. and books. Very good. Anything else? Do research on when it was written. Mm -hmm. Very good. To what? Do research on when it was written. What? Do research when it was written. Written? Oh, okay. Like, you said it so fast. I'm like, hey, what? I'm reading Malachi. What is it? When was? What, what's the time frame here? What's actually going on that he's talking about? See what I mean? Very good point. Very good point. And sometimes, um, depending on what kind of a commentary you have, it, it will sometimes be in a commentary. What you said. Any other ideas? Add with prayer. Reading the Bible is good. It's better with prayer. <laughs> it has a way of helping us apply what we're learning. has a way of God opening up our spiritual eyes that we could understand things more and how it actually pertains to us. You know what I mean? Like sometimes you'll be reading something, and maybe even you've heard a pastor do this. They'll read something from the Bible, and they'll say something that has nothing to do with what, what was, what, what the, what's actually going on in the passage. You know what I mean? Especially when like a guest speaker comes in. They'll go off on this long thing. It's like, you got that from this? But if you actually listen, they have an actually godly principle that they that, 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 they, that they have to say. See what I mean? And it was a good thing that they had to say. Does that make sense? And a lot of times the same thing will happen when you're reading. God will just kind of reveal something to you that kind of vaguely has something to do with the passage, I guess, but has absolutely nothing to do with what was originally written and, and how it directly applies. See what I mean? Why? Because the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will just show us things that we need as we seek after Him. Does that make sense? Yeah. Pay attention to what you read specifically and generally in the book and in the Bible. So basically, I'm I'm saying something kind of complex here. Let me break it down. Uh, pay attention to what you read specifically. The, the words that make up the sentence, the sentence that came before that sentence, the paragraph as a whole, what the chapter is talking about, what the book is talking about, the specifics. But then generally, what the Bible says about this thing, what it says in other areas about this thing, um, uh, uh, what the rest of the book later is going to say about this thing that he's talking about now. For instance, how many have ever heard that the word of God is, 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 is a, how does it say, a double-edged sword, uh, sharper than a double-edged sword? Well, it sounds like he's talking about the Bible until you read the, the beginning of that book where he says that Jesus is the Word of God, right? So we know that he's saying that Jesus is the Word of God who is able to distinguish our thoughts from our motives. Remember that? Yeah. See what I mean? Now all of a sudden we have the from the Bible to Jesus actively searches us. Now why is that important to the book of Hebrews? 
because sometimes you're going to do the right thing, but your heart will not be in it. You're just going through motions. And sometimes you're going to keep messing up and keep doing the wrong thing, but you're genuinely trying and you're genuinely seeking after the Lord and you just keep messing up. Don't worry. Jesus is able to distinguish the real people from the false people. He doesn't look at the outside things. He is sharper than a double-edged sword. He's able to distinguish your, your thoughts from your motives. He's able to distinguish your actions from your from your heart. He's able to distinguish that. See what I mean? You don't have to worry about God accidentally condemning you for something. See what I mean? You don't have to worry about that. Jesus sees you completely who you are, and he's able to distinguish your mess-ups from your from your rebellions. Does that make sense? He's able to tell that. You can't fool God. Which is a good thing or a bad thing, depending on whether you're doing the right thing or the wrong thing <laughs> in here. Um, and in the book, uh, or and in the Bible, yeah. So you're just basically comparing it with the rest of Scripture, comparing it with the book itself, comparing it with other books by the same author, comparing, you know, just just really get in there and kind of just pay attention, I guess. So you could, that's just, I guess number two is pay attention. Number one is add with prayer. Number two is pay attention. Number three, don't see what you want to see. Sometimes when you're reading the Bible, you will only kind of see the things that support your view. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like, I want to think that my dog that died went to heaven. So I'm going to do everything that I can to, to, to find a scripture that does that. Or, and I'm not saying it doesn't or doesn't, does or doesn't. Is that what you're going to say? No. Oh. Were you going to say something? I wasn't, and I forgot what I was going to say. I'm not saying – I'm not even commenting on the issue of whether animals go to heaven. I'm not even commenting. What I am saying is let's say another person says, I want to disprove to this person that their animal is not in heaven. So you're going to scour the Bible. Well, that's not what the Bible is for. See what I mean? The Bible is for, for our prophet to, so that we grow in righteousness, not to answer every single one of our questions. Pastor talked about this last Sunday night. Yeah. He said the Bible doesn't answer – and it doesn't tell me everything. It tells me everything I need to know that God foresaw that I needed to know for salvation. Did you know that the Bible doesn't answer everything we need to know for math? Did you know that if you've got a, a big math test coming up, you can't look to the Bible? Did you know that Diana has a has a has a Braille thing that she's taking? Did you know that if she opens up her Bible, it's probably not going to answer anything there. Why? Because it's not an issue of faith. See, what I mean, the Bible, God tells us everything in the Bible that we need to know for salvation and faith and and, and spiritual growth. Not for everything we need to know in life in general. He doesn't expect us to not go to school. Does that make sense? Yeah. Does, does that make sense? And for a long, long time, people thought that to honor the Bible meant that you had to think that it was the only thing you ever needed to know in your entire life. Don't you need to know how to read just to read the Bible? <laughs> so that in itself is a conundrum. How can you know everything you need to know from the Bible if it doesn't teach you how to read? See what I mean? Like it just a, It's just a nonsensical thing. Yes, you do need to read the Bible. Yes, it does apply to you. Yes, it, it does have things that are very applicable to you, but that doesn't mean that it's a one-stop shopping. You know what I mean? Like an guess? example of what you just said, um, my sister was and I were watching a movie, and we got to talking about what the sign of the devil would be. Mm -hmm. And she's like, oh, like, it's the microchipping. I'm like, point out in the Bible what it is. And I even proved it to her, and she's like... Well, you can't use the Bible for everything, but I proved the point. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Gr oh, my gosh, because yes. Because, again, that, there wasn't yeah. any microchipping around that. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, I, I see exactly what you mean, yeah. <laughs> and and that's a great example. When people, especially in times of people like, like you know, John Hagee, and I can't even remember all the other ones, but <laughs> so many, Van Imp, uh, Jack Van Impey, all these different people who make their life goal studying the end times. And they want to believe something. Like, for instance, if you want to see ISIS in the Bible, you're going to find ISIS in the Bible. Right. If you want to find Y2K in the Bible, you're going to find Y2K in the Bible. Why? Because you're looking for something that you want to be there. So, point number three, don't see what you want to see. See what the Bible actually says and learn the point. Why did God tell us in Revelations, for instance, about the mark of the beast? Because he's talking about the way that, that, that Satan's going to gonna get his fingers in, in government. He's going to get his fingers in, in, in the world economics. He's going to get his fingers in all these different things, and it's not going to be fair for us Christians. Yeah. But, you know, it's all right. God's still in control. It's all right. Things aren't going to happen that we're not going to like. Maybe in the future, America won't be capitalist anymore. Maybe we'll be socialist or communist. It's all right. It's all right. We're never going to have a perfect kingdom until Jesus comes anyways. See what I mean? Don't get too bent out of shape about the different things like that. 
realize that God's still in control. And that's exactly why Revelations was written. They didn't see, where's this? Where's the promise of his coming? God's still in control. Just be patient. Um, so see, don't see what you want to see. Um, I know some people were convinced that Obama was, the, President Obama was the Antichrist. And so they drew out all kinds of scripture to show that he was the Antichrist. But again, okay. they thought Hitler was, too. <laughs> they, they thought the Pope was. They thought, I mean, let's go down the <laughs> list of, of all the different people. And I already explained this. There is a spirit of the Antichrist, and there is certain Antichrist in every generation that's raised up, yes. However, there's only one Antichrist in the sense of there's only going to be one actual Antichrist. There's going to be, you know, because Satan doesn't know when the end is. So he's constantly raising up Antichrist, yes, that's true. And there is a spirit of the Antichrist that's in the world. However, there is also a person who is the Antichrist who is yet to be revealed. So, anyways, um, try a different translation. I know I this this is the saddest story you're gonna hear me tell probably. I was in Hastings, or maybe it was Barnes and Noble. Doesn't matter. Um, and there was this older couple who was shopping for a Bible. They had gone to church all their life, read the Bible their entire life. It's about time for me to stop. And they never understood a word of it. Because their church told them that they had to read the King James or nothing at all. Well, the churches I used to go to did that. They were lost. They didn't know what to, what to even. They didn't even know that there were other translations. So they get there and like, well, geez, there's a there's there's so many. Which one do I pick? How do I know if one's uh, more inspired than the other? I See what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And and so there's these people and they're oh no. The only thing that was inspired was the original manuscripts in the Greek and then the Hebrew, and Daniel was written in Aramaic with a, a few other, well, a large part of it was with a few other parts. Um, but the, the original manuscripts were what was, in, what was inspired, not our translation. So what you're trying to do is try to find a translation that you understand that's close to what the Bible was trying to say, unless you want to learn Greek and Hebrew. I mean, you can do that too. Um, and that's why I have so many different translations is because I, I study it in Greek, but I also like to see what other translators thought. Because what if I'm wrong in my translation? Well, I'd like to know by comparing it to other people. See what I mean? So I have a bunch of translations, and I have my Greek Bible. Um, but try a different translation. See, see if there's one that, that makes more sense to you. ESV is more of a college level. NASB is more of a person's over the age of 40 Bible. Um, NIV, the new one that just came out in 2011, is more of a, of a younger person's Bible. Um, the, the NIV that everybody knows that gave the NIV a bad reputation, I don't even know who that one's for. <laughs> it's just kind of terrible. But the NIV was, was purchased by, someone, by another company, re-released, retranslated in 2011. That one's really good. I, I, I have a copy of it. I really like it. Um, it, it's really for your basically your, your down to earth person. You don't have to have a big education. You can understand it. You know what I mean? Um, the NLT is for people who have no idea what the Bible is talking about, and so they need it in kind of reworded. The same as the Message Bible. It's not very accurate as to what the Bible actually said originally, but it's it's an attempt to kind of break down the walls of I don't understand what the Bible is talking about. See what I mean? Mm -hmm. So if you want to know exactly what the Bible says, don't read the New Living. Don't live the mess. Don't read the Message. Don't read those ones. But if you're having just a hard time understanding what the heck this is even talking about, go for those ones because it'll really break down that wall. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, um, <clears throat> ask for help from godly people. Sometimes I see people ask for help with the Bible from people who don't even read the Bible. <laughs> oh, this guy's a doctor. He has a PhD. Is he a Christian? No. Well then, what is he going to have inspiration, or how, how is the Holy Spirit going to use him to reveal what the Bible is talking about? It doesn't matter how smart he is, spiritually he's dead. And the Bible is a spiritual thing for spiritual people. So how can you possibly explain a spiritual thing, if you are unspiritual, to a spiritually lost person? How is that a thing? Like, it doesn't make any sense. Um, so go to godly people and ask for help. Also, I shouldn't have to say this, but just in case, don't go to people who just tell you what you want to hear. Um, so some last tips. Um, I already mentioned this one. The New Testament is not a new Old Testament. It's not a new book of the law. Um, I already mentioned this one, too. Some parts are not literal. Other parts are. Pay attention to literature. Pay attention to what you're reading. If you're reading poetry in the Bible, you need to read it like poetry. If you're reading Proverbs in the Bible, you need to read it like Proverbs. 
if you're reading law in the Bible, you know what I mean? Read it as it is. Um, yeah. And that's why it's important to know the different types of literature so you don't add anything into the text that wasn't there. Um, ask, how does that relate to what I just read? When, when you're reading through, ask, okay, now this part says this. What does that have to do with this part? Because the grand majority of times they'll connect. Now, there are some exceptions. Exception number one, the prophets. The prophets are called compilations, which means God gave the prophet a bunch of different prophecies, and he put them all together in a book. They don't necessarily all go together. Does that make sense? They're not necessarily in chronological order. They're not, not necessarily in historical order. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, exception number two, Proverbs. Because Proverbs are a short saying that are proven true by experience. So maybe there's themes in the Proverbs. Maybe they're kind of congested together at certain points. But that doesn't mean that everything you're going to read is going to necessarily flow from the next part. Um, another part, another thing is... Um, the laws. The laws aren't necessarily in any specific order that are important to know the order of how, which, not necessarily. See what I mean? Because a lot of times, especially as you get into like Leviticus and Numbers, you'll say, do this and do this. And it'll be to uh, in topical order. Like, they'll talk about the priesthood, and then we'll talk about laws of civil duty, and then we'll talk about laws of morality, or whatever. But a lot of times, they're just all jumbled together. You know what I mean? Moral laws, civil laws, legal codes, all these different things will just all be jumbled together. It, that's just how God gave it to Moses and how he wrote it down and how it's been preserved to us today. Like, it's not to say that there's any specific order to that. You know, does that make sense? So, but for, for the most part, like when you're reading the Gospels and reading the letters, always stop and say, now, what does this have to do with what I just read and what does it have to do with the next part? Um, recording is not condoning. Just because the Bible mentioned that something happened doesn't mean that it's saying that you should go and do likewise. A few examples. Judas hung himself. Hung himself. Um, the a lot of the um, people like you know Abraham and Isaac and, and Jacob married multiple wives. That doesn't mean that we should. Um, what's another example? People built idols. People built idols in the Bible. It doesn't mean that we should. Recording does not mean condoning, and people really get hung up on this. Well, the Bible says yes, but it doesn't say go ye and do likewise. <laughs> I, the, my old pastor used to always say this joke about this person who took this Bible and said, Lord, show me your will today. And so he opens it up and says, Judas hung himself. Okay, so he flips and he opens it another place and it says, go and do likewise. <gasps> <laughs> <laughs> <That's funny. laughs> so anyways, um, the Old Testament looks forward to Christ and the New Testament looks back to Christ. This doesn't mean that the Old Testament is old and obsolete and the New Testament is new and, and for us today. The whole Bible is for us. It's just different events in history different times in history um if you are interested in this oops i'm sorry let me go back i just want to go back uh see the book grasping god's word by duvall and hayes i think it's scott duvall and something hayes but anyways um they really have a have a good grasp on this and it's some it's it's good they actually just released a, another uh, an updated version of it i think it's last year so um anybody need more time yeah? I think Diana needs more time. I'm not the only one. Oh, you guys are not writing? No, I just finished my writing. Oh. She uses, I have chicken scratch. She books. uses shorthand. <laughs> oh, yes. Okay. Thank you. So just some practice here. I'll read a passage and just show you kind of how to how to do it. Huh? Oh no, it's not on the sheet. Uh, it's just to kind of show you guys. Um, if you'd like to take notes, you can go ahead. I'm kidding. <laughs> um, Exodus 19, three through six. Um, can you get the light, Grace? Oh yeah. Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob, and tell the sons of Israel, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings, and brought you to myself. Now then, if you will indeed obey my voice, and keep my co covenant, then you shall be my own possession among all the peoples, or for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the sons of Israel. So, first off, we see that the law was obedience spawned from salvation. Basically, works 
are be, are to be because of our, of our salvation. Okay. Um, we also see here <clears throat> that the effects <clears throat> the effects of those works, which were based off of faith, bear with me here. Faith, which produced works, and the the effects of the works were blessings. Um, the blessings were conditional. They wouldn't have the effects of having served God if they hadn't actually served God. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. For instance, let's say you've been praying about something and God answers it. Now roll back the clock. You haven't been praying about something and God doesn't answer it. Does that make sense? <laughs> They're conditional. It's not, I didn't pray and God answered everything for me. I didn't seek him at all and I'm somehow really close to God and I hear his voice all the time. Okay, that's something. Um, God desires what? No. Oh. God desires for us to separate ourselves for His purposes, and just like that, God desires for us to be a light. God wants to bless us if we will only but obey Him. That makes sense. So, what this passage is not saying. Once you are saved, you have to keep your salvation by your works. That's not what I'm saying at all. See? Does that kind of make sense? It's a real simple thing. I'm not going real into it, but I'm sure you can see kind of the principle of it. Um, Isaiah 7, 10 through 14. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as Sheol or high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask, nor will I test, test the Lord. Then he said, Listen now, O house of David, is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men, that you will try the patience of my of my God as well? Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall, will be with child and bear a son, and she, and she will call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Um, so first we see Ahaz tested God's patience with his disbelief. Isaiah just told him to ask for anything, and Ahaz didn't even have the faith to ask for that. And he tried to pass it off like he was super righteous or something. Oh, I'm not going to test God. Obviously, God revealed to Isaiah that he wasn't being righteous. Or he was just obvious by the way he said it. Like, oh, this guy's just being a, a douche. Um, uh, God gave him a sign anyways, which was answered to a lesser degree then, when Isaiah's wife had a, had a child. But also um, reached its full um, realization with Christ. We can trust God past scary political situations because he desires to save his people. <coughs> that, that's what's going on here. Um, there's just some, some very bad things going on politically. Ahaz is a little scared, but he doesn't want to trust in God. We can trust in God past the scary political situations because he desires to save his people. We can also trust God in what He says that it that it is true. See what I mean? Um, and it's not it's not such a th it's not it's not a good thing to test the Lord. So obey the Lord when He, when he tells you things. See what I mean? Just a bunch of different things that you can really get from that. Um, and obviously, you can go really in depth with your analysis of a passage. These are called sermons or, or times that people teach. Uh, I I do it sometimes. Um, the pastor does it on Sundays. You can you can go deeper with the passage. Um, I'm just giving a real, real brief thing on of an application that you could get from that passage. Um, so about the Yam party, I'll go ahead and stop the thing. Oh, first, were there any questions? Let me write the last one. Yeah, go ahead. Do you have a question? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording.